Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, Chris, I was trying to think when we did meet, and I think it must have been. So I'm was uh, I'm good friends with Kyle Kochler. We were roommates in college, and uh, so I know we were here for his and Ginny's wedding, and uh, even before that. So I. It was somewhere back there. I do remember one time at Presbytery, you preaching and holding a, a toilet plunger up in the air. So that's one of my fond memories of you. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it's funny. Uh, people talk about how um, you know Twitter is this horrible space of interactions and stuff. But um, actually, you know, in Japan, I feel like you and I have connected over Twitter quite a bit, and I feel like our friendship has actually grown in that, and I, I consider you a kindred spirit, um, so I appreciate that. Um, also, I appreciate this church. Um, I appreciate your support um, for us, um, not just for us, but for Japan, and I know you guys support um, the Carters. Um, Kathleen is one of uh, my wife Karen's very closest friends in Japan. We're in different parts of the country, um, but they often connect. Kathleen will come and visit for the weekend or, or just to, to get with Karen. Um, they're great friends of ours. Um, you guys support the Canes. Um, the ministry that the Canes do for, uh, for missionary kids is uh, it's invaluable. Um, all three of my daughters have uh, spent time uh, talking, Zooming um, with Reva um, as they've kind of gone through their, their high school years. Um, Brooks and Reva are, are amazing. Uh, they're so great. We're so appreciative of them. And I know you guys also support the Otohans, and uh, they're a huge part of our team. Um, Anthony works directly with me um, at Oyumino. He's a deacon for our church, and he helps run our English outreach ministry. Um, so it's, uh, there's a, a number of great connections that exist, and I'm, just, I'm really grateful for those. And I want to I thank you for that. Um, so the, the text that we're looking at today um, is in the Gospel of John. Um, the event we're looking at uh, is found only in John's Gospel. This passage comes after Christ's death and the resurrection, after Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time and then appeared a second time, remember with Thomas present, doubting Thomas. So this story records uh, a third time that Jesus appeared to disciples after his resurrection. And it really forms a bookend from the beginning of his ministry to the end. From the calling of the first disciples to them being sent out to begin their mission of establishing the church that we see in Acts and through church history. So I'm going to read from John uh, chapter 21. I'll start in verse 1 and read through Verse 22, um, this is the word of the Lord. Everything um, that I say to you today, I hope, will be faithful to God's word, uh, but this is God's word. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they are not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came, into the boat, uh, came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they are not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land... They saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. 
And although there were so many, the net, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that you've given to us. I pray that you would bless now the preaching of your word. Uh, Lord, help me to be faithful in what I present. Pray that your Holy Spirit would work in all of us. Uh, help us to, uh, to, to learn, to understand, um, and to take hold of the, the gospel and of your grace to us. God, be with us now. Be glorified in this time, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, I think that Peter has always been my favorite character in the Bible. I mean, obviously, Jesus is the best, but I feel like Peter is the guy that I relate to the most because he is such a failure. All disciples fail, all humans fail. But Peter stands out as this one who is so eager to jump in, so confident in his beliefs, and so often the one who seems to commit the biggest blunders. When I first wrote this sermon, I thought about naming it, Oh, Peter. Because that's how I often feel when I read about him. Oh, Peter, what are you doing? I originally preached it in Japan, and I couldn't figure out how to write, oh, in Japanese. So I decided to call it Failure and Restoration. But I want to think about the entire length of Peter's story in particular as we look at what's happening here in John. First off, this account was not the first example of a miraculous catch of fish. Let's jump back in time to one of the earliest meetings between Peter and Jesus. All three Gospels describe when Jesus called Peter to follow him. So Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen. Um, and they were business partners with a man named Zebedee, whose two sons, James and John, also fished with him. Right? So in Matthew 4 and Mark 1, it says that Jesus came upon Peter and his brother Andrew casting nets into the sea. Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Then he calls James and John, who are on the shore, mending their nets. Why were they mending their nets? Well, because of what happened in Luke 5. Jumping back a little earlier, see, Jesus was preaching to the crowds near the Lake of Galilee, and it says they're pressing in around him. And so he got into Peter's boat... Um, and they moved out a little from the shore. See, Jesus wanted to create a space uh, from the crowds uh, so that he could, um, that they, they could all see and, and, and hear him. And so he decides to stand in this boat like his own little pulpit. 
But when he's done preaching, Jesus told Peter, put out on the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter is like, um, now we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. Don't you love it when you're struggling to do something that, that you know how to do? And someone who really knows nothing about it comes up and starts giving you advice. Have you tried fishing over here? Yes. Yes, of course. I've, I've tried fishing over here. I've tried fishing over there. I've tried fishing everywhere. There are no fish, Sam I am. We tried all night. But then I think he tries to be polite and he says, oh, but it's your word. I will let down the nets. He knows there aren't going to be any fish. He knows he's wasting his time. And suddenly there are so many fish that the nets start breaking, which is the reason that James and John had to mend those nets. Well, how does Peter respond to this miracle? Does he say, oh, thank you, Lord, what a blessing. No, he says, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, Lord. Oh, Peter. He sees this miracle. He comes to the conclusion that Jesus is divine, but he doesn't fall down in worship. He doesn't beg Jesus, let me follow you. No, he says, get away from me. I appreciate his Humility, you know, recognizing he's a sinner and thus unworthy to be in God's presence, but he so misunderstands Jesus. In his fear, he wants distance from the Lord. But Jesus tells him, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Don't run away, Peter. Come, follow me teach others to follow me. You know, Peter's time following Jesus is filled with so many lowlights. Think about the transfiguration, right? Peter is present when, when Jesus is, is transfigured and glowing with, with the, the Shekinah glory. Moses and Elijah appear and begin talking with Jesus. And Peter is like, Jesus, do you want me to make some tents for you guys? This voice from heaven says, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Oh, Peter. I too know something about talking when I ought to be listening. Think of Peter's confession of the Christ. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples answer, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter makes this amazing confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes! And Peter gets it. What amazing faith and insight. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, because God himself has revealed this to you. But then just a couple verses later, Jesus says, now I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and die. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. This is the accomplishment of redemption, right? But Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen. Oh, Peter. You just confessed that Jesus is God. And now you're rebuking him, telling him what to do. There are so many other examples of Peter's failures that I could mention. Comparing himself with and competing against the other disciples, sleeping while Jesus prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, cutting off a servant's ear with his sword, 
even later in life, showing prejudice against the Gentile believers in the church. But I think Peter's very worst failure was on the night when Jesus was betrayed. Matthew 26, Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. You know what happened. After his boast, he would never fall away. After he claimed he would die first. After he said, even if those others fall away, I will not. Three times, Peter lies and says, I don't know that man. And after the third time, it says that Jesus turned and met his eyes. And Peter remembered his boasts and his promises and Jesus' words, and it crushed him. It says he went away and he wept bitterly. Jesus hadn't given up on him. Today's passage, Jesus has already been raised from the dead, and now now Peter and the disciples are sitting around trying to figure out what to do. And Peter says, who wants to go fishing? The ministry's over. What else do these guys know how to do? And so they're fishing, and once again, they spend a whole night and catch nothing. I kind of wonder if they just weren't very good fishermen. But then this voice from the shore calls out, have you tried fishing over here? So they cast the net. Now they're not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Something must have felt very familiar. And John says what they're all thinking. It's the Lord. And Peter does what anyone would do. He puts his clothes on. He jumps in a lake. Now, most of us would probably take off some clothes before jumping into water. But Peter was fishing, probably wearing just a loincloth. He doesn't want to appear before Jesus in his underwear. He wants to be presentable to his Lord. It's interesting. Remember the last time with the miraculous catch of fish? How did Peter respond? Get away from me, Lord. And now he's diving into the water, jumping in to get close to Jesus. He longs to draw near to the Savior. And so they all eat breakfast together. It must have been such a strange meal. And then Jesus turns to Peter, and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these, more than these other disciples love me? Because you boasted, even if these guys fall away, I never will. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus asks him again. And then Jesus asks him again. Three times, for the three times that Peter denied him, for the three times he lied, saying he didn't know Jesus. And it says, Peter was grieved Because Jesus said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Now, for each time that Jesus asks him, Peter responds. He tells him, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed 
my sheep. And then he says to him, follow me. The same words that Jesus said to him way back in the beginning. Oh, Peter, what are you doing back here fishing? I told you, you are going to be a fisher of men. I like Peter because I can relate to him. He was so often a failure. And I look at my life, and I am so often a failure. I'm confronted every day, no, every moment, by the ways that I fall short. Every angry word, every judgmental feeling, every ruptured relationship, every incomplete task, every lustful thought, every selfish desire, every fearful denial of my Savior. And I know that every one of you also knows what it means to be a failure. I didn't call Chris and, and ask him for a report on all of you, but I know that we as human beings, as fallen, sinful people, are all failures. What do we do with that failure? Does it make you want to run and hide from God? Like Adam and Eve hiding in the garden? Like Peter, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. Or does it make you want to jump in a lake fully clothed because you won't let anything keep you away from Jesus? In the account in Luke 22, when Jesus predicted Peter's betrayal, he said this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. I'm convinced that we live under the constant attack of Satan. He hates us. He hates the church. Above all, he hates God. He wants us to fail. He wants to see us bitter and broken, fighting with one another, discouraged, weary, hopeless. He wants us to return to our nets gathering fish instead of gathering people for God's kingdom. But we need to remember, even when we sin and fail, Jesus prays for us that our faith may not fail. If our faith is in Jesus, he will restore us. Because we're not saved by our faithfulness. We're saved by putting our faith in the one who is faithful. And when we turn back, we're able to strengthen those around us who also are weak and failing. Just as Peter was restored. The man who abandoned Jesus and swore he didn't know him, is the same man who stands up just a few days, weeks later at Pentecost and inaugurates the church when he starts boldly proclaiming the risen Christ, calling on everyone present to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. The man who so often had failed and would continue to fail in the future has become a bold evangelist and missionary. When the Jewish leaders see him, they hear him, they can't believe it. Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. What a description. What a high 
compliment. I would love when people saw and heard me if they said, that guy has been with Jesus. I pray that for all of us here. Heard a story of a, of a young child, and the parents were explaining, uh, they were explaining the gospel, and they said, you know, when you, when you believe in Jesus, he comes and he lives in your heart. And this child thought, I'm small, but Jesus is, he's big, he's a grown-up. And he asked, Would, since Jesus is bigger than me, if he lives in my heart, won't he show through? Won't people be able to see him? Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. I think there's no better way to end this sermon than with Peter's own words. See if you can hear echoes of Peter's experience that morning by the Lake of Galilee in what he wrote in his letter, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Oh, my friends, even in our failures, let us not lose hope, but know that Jesus is there to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are all failures. So we fall short of who we want to be. We fall short of what you have called us to be in your word. We turn away from you. We follow our own idolatries. We turn to sin so often. And, and God, that makes us ashamed. But I pray that our, our response would not be shame, would not be running away from you and hiding but that even in our sin and failure, that we would run towards you, boldly confessing our sin and, and boldly grabbing hold of the promises of your gospel that we are forgiven in Christ. Lord, help us to, to know you and to experience you more deeply and more fully. We pray this in Christ's name.